Boyd Taylor. He likes to do that. So where are you, Boyd? He's moving. He's moving today. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you all for coming. I think we're going to even have more people. And uh, Chuck's got people on standby to add some more chairs. Financial questions have been a major area of interest by a lot of our residents. And I think some is just that we have so many new residents coming in all at once and they're being overwhelmed with a lot of things and you begin to ask more seriously after you start to settle in a little bit. And uh, some of us that have been here for a while have taken longer to settle in and when other people ask questions, we begin to say, well, that's a good question. What about, what about? So I think, Chuck, we ended up with about, it was about 45 questions um, from residents. And what I tried to do is take those questions and, went, and then I went through and, and combined things that were on the same topic. So there may actually be a few more questions within a question. And then Chuck and I have had some conversations about how's the best way uh, to answer. And I really felt like we need some charts and graphs and pie charts even was one of the things recommended by someone in their questions. Um, who sent the questions in has been kept anonymous. I just sent the questions in toto, well actually in three different batches um, to Chuck. And he and the staff have spent and actually had about, uh, about two inches worth of PowerPoints ready. We know we're not gonna get through all of that, so Chuck and his staff have gone through, I think Paul's, Paul Filgers has been a part of that too, and really um, picked the questions that seem to be the highest interest in and that were maybe needing a little bit more detail that we prepare uh, charts and so forth for. So we also are recording this. You'll see Maria here um, and, and uh, as we uh, come on in, you all come on in and find a seat. There's a few more scattered within here. Um, but we also asked when you came in if you have additional questions that you want to offer here. We'll have a 30 minute presentation and, and that's coming from the 45 questions, and at the end of that 30 minutes, then we'll take questions from, from the floor, and that will happen by you having written your question on a card. So if you decide you didn't get a card and you wanna ask a question, feel free to go back to the back, and Ruth is back there with uh, cards and also uh, pens to be able to write your questions. And then, um, if you will just hand those questions in, when we get to the end of the presentation, we'll ask, and when we get to the end of the business portion, we'll ask that if you have any, any cards at that point, and we'll take them up, and then at the end of the 30 minute presentation, we'll ask again. Okay, so the meeting is officially called to order. And uh, we do definitely have a quorum. And uh, the first thing that I'd like to do is in your handouts when you came in are the names of the people who in this quarter, and it's on about the third page, um, who, are, who have died during this quarter, this second quarter. And so um, we're not gonna call out the names, but if you will, Join me in a moment of silence just to think about these people. Thank you. And 
now a recognition of yes, Paul Hilders is our chair. If you would just stand, Paul. And uh, do we have any other board members? Paul is chair of the board of the governing body for Westminster. Yes, and there's Anne. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and then recognition of new residents. If you have not been to one of these quarterly meetings before, would you please stand? All right. Let's give them a big welcome. And now I'm going to call on Julie Crack Brooks to bring forth the minutes. Our uh, secretary, Lori Humphreys, is in cooler weather. <laughs> And so I'm going to turn it over to Julie. All right. The uh, first quarterly meeting of 2022 of the Westminster Residents Association was held Monday, April 4th, 2022, in Harrisville Hall. President Camille Miller called the 2022 first quarterly meeting to order at 2 p.m. in Harrisville Hall. She cited that the required quorum of 30 residents were in attendance. WRA Executive Committee member and liaison with the Austin Community College Foundation, Cynthia Leach, introduced Foundation Executive Director Amy Bauckham, who thanked the WRA members for the $15,000 contribution to establish an endowment for ACC students. The first WRA scholarship will be used for culinary students. Bauckham also described Austin Community College programs. There was a moment of remembrance for departed WRA friends. Miller recognized new residents. She also thanked Boyd Taylor for his revision of, quote, what is the Westminster Residents Association, unquote, which will be posted on the portal. WRA Vice President Jer Smith reported that the April 20th wine tasting fundraiser is sold out. She encouraged people to donate if they were not attending and congratulated Wine Tasting Fundraiser Chair Bobby Collins and her committee for their work. Westminster at 55, History Project Director Boyd Taylor thanked the members of his project team, especially Nancy Simons for the cover design and Jim Woodrick for his research and computer skills. WRA Secretary and Co-Managing Editor of the Westminster Writers' Journal, Lori Humphreys, thanked Boyd Taylor for his leadership and vision for Westminster at 55. She invited residents to become a Westminster writer and submit a poem, essay, fiction, or memoir to the fourth edition of the journal. Westminster Board President Paul Hilgers addressed the audience. WR Tra WRA Treasurer Sharon Verlander presented the Treasurer's Report. As of January 1st, 2022, the Frost Bank WRA operating account had a balance of $5,567.62. As of March 31st, 2022, the Frost Bank WRA operating account account had a balance of $21,575.13. Additional financial narrative is attached to the minutes. Cynthia Leach moved to accept the report. Melissa Wyman seconded. The report was accepted un un unanimously. Excuse me. <laughs> so then, your note, the audience saying happy birthday to Westminster Executive Director Charles Borst. His report included a construction update. He also said that the keyless entry system will begin in April. Spectrum will be installing Wi-Fi. The solar panel roof project will begin in June. The first hybrid vehicle was added to the fleet. Strategic partners have donated $41,755 to the Westminster Employee Scholarship Fund to acknowledge Westminster's 55th anniversary. Any amount over 100,000 will be donated to the WRA ACCF Endowment. 
Boris listed the April events which will celebrate the 55th anniversary. From June 1st to June 21st, there will be a resident satisfaction survey. Boris encouraged all residents to participate. All floors with 100% participation will have a cocktail party. Resident John Selsman asked where he could find a Westminster financial report. He was told that it could be found in the annual report. Cynthia Leach moved and Jerry Smith seconded the motion to adjourn, which passed unanimously. Residents received their gift copy of Westminster at 55. The History Project team members, Don Davis, Lori Humphreys, Robert Rudhauser, Bill Schluss, Phyllis Schenken, Nancy Simons, Boyd Taylor, Jim Woodrick, and Don Lucash signed books. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? Would you like to move? I move we accept the minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. Okay, thank you. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the minutes are approved. Sharon Verlander, our treasurer, present the treasurer's report. Thank you. Mainly, mainly for the newcomers that don't know me. I'm Sharon. Everybody over here knows me, I think. In January, or the latter part of December, I was elected as the treasurer for the WRA for 2022-2023. This time is a little different. We had passed out a copy of the balance sheet ending June 30th. Behind the balance sheet is a copy of the profit and loss statement for the first six months. I would be happy to answer any questions regarding the balance sheets or the PL. Basically, you see. Um, those of you who are not familiar with balance sheets, we currently have $25,082.14 in our operating account. Any questions? Thank you. <laughs> that makes my life easy. We have a motion to approve. Okay, Paul makes the motion. A second? Okay, Paul, you second? Thank you. Just because everybody on this side knows me, rumors going around that the pool is open and warm. And I will be one of the first ones down there tonight. <laughs> Bill checked it out at 11 for the aerobics and said it was warm. Okay, uh, all in favor of accepting the treasurer's report, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The report is passed. Accepted. Okay. Is there any new business anyone wants to bring forward that, that we haven't heard about or not been informed about? That's always an option. Yes. Since I chaired the dress code committee before I became president, may I get you a copy of that? And is there anything else you'd like to say in response to why you're asking or? Well, I've got some sundresses I like to wear and I don't know if they're appropriate. Okay, okay. Um, we will get a copy of the dress code and have it put in everyone's box and everyone's coats, okay? Any other? Comments, questions, thoughts? 
Okay, I have really been looking forward to this. So Chuck and Paul, if you guys would come on up. Um, first of all, because there was so much interest by the residents, I really felt like this kind of a meeting would be the best way for people to get their, to get a better understanding of the operations of Westminster. Paul Hilbers is the chair of the governing board and uh, of course you know that Chuck is our executive director for the whole shebang. And I um, work for all of you. He works for all of us. And um, we don't anticipate that we'll get through everything that's been asked, but we're not gonna wear you out. We're gonna do 30 minutes of presentation and then 30 minutes for questioning, and then the bar will be open. <laughs> we, okay. we could Thanks open so it now. No, 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 let's not do that. Not like that. <laughs> well, we're glad to be here. I'll, Chuck, if I could, I'll start. Miss Bowles. I don't know why you all were so quiet while I was a treasurer. But nobody ever asked me this. <laughs> Ms. Bowles, would you like to take over for me this afternoon? <laughs> I'm more <careful> <laughs> um, well, I am Paul Hilkers, and I am the chairman of the board, and it's an honor to be the chairman. I, I think Diane Williams is here. Diane, where are you? There you are. I just want you all to, Diane Williams is also on the board and almost never misses any opportunity to come and be with you. Um, and where are the rest of board members? Yeah, I was going to ask if there, I don't think there are any other board members here, but are there any, oh, they're, they're the resident board members. You should proudly so, stand. Jim, so, 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 there you go. Yeah. Resident board members, absolutely. Um, before I, I'm going to jump in as the chairman and say a few words first, and then I'm going to try real hard to be quiet. I did not know that the biggest challenge of this presentation, they kept from me. I'll just let you know. They did not tell me that we had to try to do this in 30 minutes. <laughs> so that's not fair. There's too much information to share in 30 minutes, but we're glad to share all that we can in 30 minutes. I'll just say a couple of things. Um, one, you do have a very hardworking board and you have a very unique board. Um, I've served on the board for several years and one of the most unique things about the board is the fact that we have voting members three voting members who are resident members. And they provide great insight. And as I've said before, when they become resident board members, they become exceedingly popular to all of the residents while they're serving uh, because they hear about what's going on in your lives. And I will tell you that just like Chuck, the board's highest priority is your quality of life uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. But the board's responsibility, fundamentally, is to preserve and protect the long-term viability and sustainability of this community so that it's around in perpetuity. Um, there's, a, there's been an incredible amount of, of work, of challenge that you have all faced, that the associates have faced over the last two and a half to three years that are really you don't really want to revisit it because if you told the story of what you've been through, you would be exhausted again. Um, except to say that the grace that you have shown as residents to each other and to the residents and to the new construction and to all of the processes that have been going on is very unique for a community like this. And the thing that makes Westminster the, what we continue to strive to be the very best facility in the country are the people who live here and the people who haven't come yet. So with that, Chuck has a presentation. I'm going to try to be quiet so he can get through as much information as possible. Those who know me know that being quiet is not my strongest suit, but I will do my best. Chuck. All right. Can we just do away with the 30 minute thing? <laughs> yes. All right. Okay. Um, I always like to start off with a little humor, okay, so we can do that, right? We have time for that, which is, 
Which is smarter financial move investing in hog futures or loading up the freezer with bacon when it's on sale? <laughs> this is where we started to draw taller bars to please you guys. Pie charts cost too much, so I ordered tart charts. I actually do have pie charts in those. Our only problem is figuring out how to switch these two things, income and expenses. The stewardship committee's latest idea for helping to raise the annual church budget deposit 75 cents to enter the menu. <laughs> All right, out of funny, this is the budget process. This was one of the questions in the presentation or the, that were submitted. So in mid-July, which is right about now, we'll get the June financials. Those will be, so we'll see half of a year. We're gonna annualize that year and the associate executive director, the accounting director, submits the annualized financial results to the leadership team and requests next year's budget projections. And this includes contract renewals and increased projections from vendors, like for instance, raw food cost. Um, what do we think that we're gonna be paying for um, beef tenderloin in the new year? And we try to anticipate that by working with our vendors. What do we think electricity costs are going to be? We get those numbers from Austin Energy. Do they project that they're gonna be a six to eight percent increase in 2023? Yes, things like that. So we use all that to formulate the budget. In, Aug in August, we start to work with the department heads to develop the budgets and refine them on a line by line basis. Rough drafts are provided to me. Um, typically it's two to three rough drafts, which I redline and I black -lined, and I have highlighted and then I turn around to Sarah, the accounting director, the uh, associate executive director, who then um, formulates a rough draft with the budget. Um, usually there's a couple rough drafts that I'll review. Um, that second week of um, September, I usually get that back to her. She creates a second draft that goes to LCS Finances, and they will review it for about two weeks and try to look for any flaws in the budget. Then it's returned back to us, and I'll look at it one last time. Um, this is typically in early October, the third draft of the budget um, is presented by Sarah to me, and then I'll go over a final review, uh, okay the budget to present to the Finance Committee on the board, and then finally, the Finance Committee will make its recommendations, we'll formalize the budget, they'll approve it, and then we present it to the Board of Directors for approval, usually in October. Once the board has approved the budget, then it's uploaded by LCS. And that's, uh, so it's budget creating season right now. I don't know if it's the starting of that season. Um, one of the questions submitted is, how is the budget monitored, tracked, and adjusted? So budget reports are compiled monthly and provided to leadership, the board, and LCS management. All invoices are approved by the directors and by me. So every single invoice, um, we get a dairy invoice three times a week, it's $56 or so. Every invoice I go in and click our initial off on, and so do each director. The variance reports are provided by the directors for any budget variance of $200 or more. So say for instance, um, we run a lobster special and in the, in the uh, dining services, and you all really like lobster, and you buy more lobster than the um, seafood budget would cover for the month. So if, that, if there's a variance of $200 or more, then I have to get a variance explanation, which the board also gets. Um, so we do that every month. Adjustments to the budget must be approved by the <coughs> board of directors. Very few changes to the budget are made. Um, sometimes there's a project that was not anticipated that might cause a capital improvement budget change. So like recently, I'll give you an example. Um, two of the heat exchangers on the roof of the Windsor building failed. Um, so they need to be replaced. Um, if those people that are living in the Windsor may remember over the last several years that the Windsor building has had repeatedly uh, problems with heat exchangers failing. So we have a project in the budget now that was approved at the last meeting. It's about $200,000 to replace those heat exchangers with a boiler type system. 
which we believe will solve the problems for the Windsor building going forward. Um, that was a capital expense improvement project that was not anticipated when we put the budget together in October of last year. So that's an adjustment to the budget. It will pay for itself over a period of time because we won't have to replace those heat exchangers. To replace a heat exchanger is about $35,000 a year of, of, of replacement. Um, so this um, will provide redundancy for us in the boiler system and will cost us less in the future. It also uses less energy. Um, what, what, what has the budget looked like over the last five years? Can you show us pie charts? And I have pie charts. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna show you. This is um, actually a pie chart that you get in the annual increase letter that we put out. Um, this is the budget revenue in totality, so the summary of the budget. Basically, it's explaining where the revenue comes from in different areas. The blue area is all of you. Total apartment revenue, so independent living apartment revenue. Um, total health center revenue is the orange. If we were a standalone health care center and not a life plan product, that orange area of the pie would be a lot larger. We write off about six million dollars a year in health care costs. Um, the gray area of the pie chart um, is assisted living. The um, yellow area is clinic revenue. So the total other operating revenue is so small that you don't even see it, but that would be like guest room income. And then 2022 expenses, and this is very interesting, 52% of our expenses is wages. And that's, that equates to about $12.78 million a year. Employee taxes and benefits is the second largest category, and it's about $3.078 million, so about $3 million. Um, and that's the health insurance, the 403B, 401K, um, uniforms, things, uh, PTO, vacations, all of those things. Um, health center is about 5%, food is about 8%, um, management fees and salaries, uh, LCS is 5%. Um, utilities is about 5%. Just looking back, um, 2021 is pretty much the same as far as percentages go. Uh, 2020 as well. 2018 and 2019. 2018 it was 21 or 51%. 2019 wages was 50%. In 2019, we started implementing a compensation increase package, a plan to increase our wages, to make them living wages. Um, and that's one of the things that's insulated you all from uh, significant monthly service fee increases over the last several years. And I'll show you that in a later slide. But in 2017, our wages were $9.5 million compared to $12 million today, almost 13. And our um, employee taxes and benefits was $2.4 million as opposed to $3 million today. So over the years, we've incurred a lot of um, insurance premium costs to um, cover our health insurance for our associates. And I will say that our health insurance is one of the most robust packages in the industry. Um, what triggers a budget change? Typically, it's a significant change in anticipated expenses. So when we put the budget together in 2021 for 2022, um, maybe there's a change in the market and all of a sudden wages uh, for CNAs have increased amongst our competitors and our market. We're no longer competitive in the market. We may make a change to our budget. I'll go, in fact, in 2020, I did exactly that. We did a wage study and we found that we were not the top 25 percentile in wages to CNAs. So we asked the board for an increase to the budget. Um, also, things will occur outside of our contingency for capital expenses. Um, 
either we can make an adjustment where we may reallocate a capital expense budget. So for instance, uh, a couple of years ago, instead of re refurbishing an elevator, we redirected the money for a, a huge chiller repair that we needed to have done. Um, so we reallocated, but the board has to approve every change to the budget. I can't just go about um, reallocating. Um, we did a, you know, we did an assessment on the elevator. There hadn't been that many work orders um, submitted for it, so we felt like that was the safe thing to do. How many budget adjustments had to be made this year in 2022 alone, and why were they necessary? Only the one budget adjustment was made in 2022, and that just happened in June. Um, and that was, again, that domestic hot water uh, improvement project that I talked to you about. Um, do you have contingency funds budgeted for unexpected needed expenditures? Yes, we typically budget $175,000 to $200,000 per year. We also have a replacement reserve for emergencies of approximately $12 million. This is a board designated fund. Uh, what were some of the unexpected necessary expenditures this year? Um, so we had to replace an oven in the Laurel kitchen. That was $26,000. We had a water line repair that hit the contingency budget. That was $14,000. Uh, the Windsor heating boiler. So um, back in the winter, one of the heating boilers failed in the Windsor and we had to replace it at the cost of $58,000. Uh, various apartment HVAC repairs of about $18,000 and then we bought washers and dryers back for backup for the Preston Laundry facilities at $9,000. What are the names of the other nonprofit communities in Austin? Uh, Carencia, Longhorn Village, and Buckner are three names of um, senior living nonprofit communities. Please explain the difference between Westminster as a nonprofit and other senior living facilities that are for profit. So that's covered on the next slide. A lot of print here. The for-profit organization is built to serve the business owners. The nonprofit organization is built to serve society at large. Profit organizations can be in a company, a sole proprietorship, a partnership. A nonprofit organization can be in trust, club, society, <coughs> committees, etc. Profit organizations make a profit by directly and indirectly selling goods or services. Nonprofit organizations can sell goods or services mainly through donations, subscriptions, or membership fees, like your monthly service fee. The financial statements <coughs> prepared for for-profit organizations are income statements, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. The financial accounts uh, for nonprofit organizations are the receipts and payment account, the income and expenditure account, and the balance sheet. For-profit organizations typically pay dividends to their investors. Nonprofit communities reinvest margins back into the organization. Um, For-profit communities are profit-driven. You know, they're responsible to bondholders, investment uh, investors. Um, they want to make dividends. Un they're typically unstable, so the organization's easily affected by economic fluctuations, market changes. <clears throat> they typically don't have community oversight like our volunteer board of directors. Um, they're, they're overseen by corporate investors, which are typically out of state, or shareholders. Um, typically, it's inferior quality because they're more focused on making profits than the quality of care that they provide. Um, Not-for-profit communities like ours, we're really about values. Um, we're caring for the needs of the residents is more important than increasing profits. Proceeds are reinvested into the community. Um, staff is stable, resident staff and community enjoy peace of mind because the organization is not easily affected by the economic fluctuations. Um, community oversight, a volunteer board of directors consisting of community leaders, ensure quality service and leadership, and then quality really is our barometer. Like Paul said, we want you to have the best life possible at every level of care um, every day here at Westminster and that's our barometer. Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of being a nonprofit? Um, I would say advantages, internal life, as long as the purpose remains relevant. So as long as we remain relevant as a community, we'll have life. Um, our tax-exempt status, certainly, we are quality-focused. 
Um, personal liability protection, so if this place goes down, I don't go down too, but <laughs> we don't want it to go down. Larger organizational impact. So our impact is not just at Westminster, but we have an impact around the community, around Central Texas and around Texas. Some of the things that we develop here are used at other communities, other senior living sites. Disadvantages, there's a lot more paperwork. A lot more paperwork. Um, shared control, <coughs> we're under more scrutiny. So we have the audits that we have to have. Um, everyone's looking at us all the time. Limited political actions and more internal politics. Um, we need to get you on board before we do an expansion. If you're a for-profit entity being controlled by stockholders, eh, let's just do it. We're ready, you know, let's do it. Um, so there's a lot more internal politics. <laughs> How is a monthly fee calculated? In other words, what drives the cost of the monthly fee? And the easy answer to that is everything, right? Everything. Um, wages and benefits certainly are the biggest things. Food and supply costs, Utility costs, insurance premiums are a big thing. Um, one of the things that we're very blessed with as being part of the LCS family is that we have a really great business insurance product that helps keep our premiums down because we're participating with 150 communities across the United States. Um, so when there's an issue of one facility, it doesn't affect us all um, because the totality of us doing business together helps us keep our premiums about 30% lower than um, if we were able to, if we had to go out on the market and get it ourselves, which is hundreds of thousands of dollars that it saves us. Um, <clears throat> service fee increases, so cable services, uh, Wi-Fi services, trash pickup, the same things that affect, you know, you and your individual house, those types of things. Uh, what are the thing? What are things we as residents can do to keep our monthly fees from rising? Um, you can eliminate waste. Uh, refer to the community, both residents and associates. So talk about Westminster in a positive way, right? Um, help us maintain high occupancy. When we have high occupancy, meaning the census is higher and we have less empty apartments, that's good for everybody. It helps keep our monthly service fees low. Speak positively about Westminster. Um, Westminster as a community is a great place to live and work, it really is. Support Westminster and the mission of Westminster. Um, be kind to our associates. Even when you're frustrated, they didn't make the stake the right way, they'll make it right. And if they don't make it right, let me know about it and I'll make it right. Um, be kind to your neighbors. Be a good neighbor. Nobody wants to move into a place where there's a bunch of, you know, rotten neighbors around. <laughs> you know, don't have parties at, you know, one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Try to keep those down to a minimum. Um, you know, just support our marketing efforts. Don't, you know, when you see somebody in the hall and, and you know clearly they're with one of our marketing associates and they're, they're walking around getting a tour, don't say, who the hell are you? <laughs> Be nice to them. Hey, welcome to Westminster. You're going to love it here. Something like that. Right? That All of those things help us, right? Don't go shopping at the Continental Breakfast for your supplies for the month. <laughs> Not that anybody does that. Um, please show a trend over the last five years of fee increases for Westminster versus our competitors. These are covered on the next slide. It's a great story to tell. Over the last several years, you can see that we have kept our increases to monthly service fees at 3% or less. Since I've been executive director, I'm proud to say. Currency and Longhorn. Um, so far, Currency, I think, uh, in January passed along a 6.4% increase, and they're adding August 1, a 4.3% increase this year. Over the last several years you can see that we have been much more competitive we've done a really good job in managing our expenses down renegotiating when we can and making sure that we're doing the very best um, with the dollars that that we have um, the village at the triangle passed along a seven percent increase in 2022 um, the industry top 25 percent i was just curious and you can see 12 percent for the last two years 10 percent 
Um, it's rough out there, folks. We really kept you pretty insulated over the last several years. One of the things that I want to add, because Chuck just flippantly said this, but I think there are two things you need to know about. Um, this is a really important slide, and it's important to the board, and it's important to y'all. Uh, because how you determine your monthly fee increases is probably the most important question that you have about the budget. And so the thing about the budgeting process and all the things you've heard goes to the Finance Committee. It's, it's basically generated up from the staff based upon cost estimates. All of those things are designed to try to make sure that whatever they need to operate the facility is budgeted appropriately. And we've been able to do that since, as Chuck said, since he's been here and keep it at 3%. Um, we'll talk about some of the reserves secondly, but I wanted to mention two things that Chuck, since he said, since he got here. And I wanted to give you two other statistics and two other important pieces of information about what's happened here since Chuck got here. And there are two things. Every, we have, as Chuck said, a lot of people look at us, state auditors, health auditors, but all of our financial audits, which you can go look at, there is every financial audit that we've had has been completely clean with no deficiencies ever since he's been here. That's amazing, um, especially in the middle of a pandemic when Auditors were just hungry to find something. Uh, when, well, I won't go into that, but the, I have a good story, but I won't tell it. The, um, and, and, and the second thing is that is, I think, one of the most important things, and it's included in, in, embedded in some of your future questions, and that is your concern about the associates, which I really appreciate, and I knew it was a concern of my mom and dad when they lived here, but Ever since Chuck has been here, Westminster has been selected as one of the best places in Austin to work ever since he became executive director. And those are two facts that just can't be overstated about the importance of his leadership. And so I thought I'd just jump in here for a second because I was as quiet as long as I could possibly be quiet. Okay, Chuck. You did really well. All right. Um, question, keep going into the questions more. So why does Westminster have such large reserves? Um, I think great investment policy certainly helped. A lot, we have a large entrance fee liability though. Yes, we have great reserves. We have you know, approximately 1,400 days cash on hand right now. Of course, the market, we started out the year with 1,600, right? That was a lot better. So the market hasn't been kind to Westminster either, but we, we will, it's a long ride, so we'll wait, right? But there's a large entrance fee liability, so that's a liability that's owed to all those folks that have a 90% return of capital contract, right? The board and the leadership proactively planning for the future of the community and potential expenses. Um, having a $12 million replacement reserve for emergencies, that's extraordinary. Nobody in the industry has that kind of reserve, and what that means is if every, if every air conditioning system in the Preston building failed tomorrow, knock on wood, is there wood? There's wood. <laughs> um, we could replace them. Not a lot of communities are in that position. And we can replace them without borrowing money. Um, that's a great place to be. If the roof needs to be replaced, we can do that. Of course, we have insurance. But besides that, we have this replacement reserve. Um, what purpose and how much was used in 2022 for from reserve funds? Um, approximately 700,000 for Preston, the Preston Boiler Project in 2021. So that with 200,000 planned, that's the only $200,000 expenditure in 2022. So far. So far. This is plastic, but you need to find some plastic. Well, it's the intent that's pure, right? What is the, what is the trend? on reserves over the last five years. They typically grow about 6% per year. With the exception of 2022, we have seen an unrealized decrease of our reserve of about 8% year to date. Why aren't the reserve funds used for making improvements in our infrastructure? My answer to that is they are. New roof, 
new exterior to the Preston building, new window film and seals to the Preston building, a new chiller and cooling tower, chiller rebuilds, heating and air conditioning replacements, elevator rebuilds, water lines, thermostats, heat strips, various other capital improvement projects. That's exactly what we're using our reserves for. We spend about $3 million a year on just the regular capital improvements. And then we do these reserve projects as well, where we've really improved the uh, infrastructure, and especially on the Preston building. Um, and we had, you know, when I became executive director here, we had a lot of deferred maintenance. The roof needed to be replaced since um, 2007. And we were able to get it done, I think we did it in 2016. Uh, but it, it, lots of projects, lots of infrastructure projects. Why aren't the reserve funds used for reducing our monthly fees? Because they wouldn't be reserves <laughs> if the funds were used to offset the operational budget shortfalls. It's like it's like you have a fifty thousand dollar nest egg savings account, right? But you're going to spend three thousand dollars more than you make a month, right? Not have a balanced budget. You're going to eventually spend those reserves down to nothing, right? Reserves are exactly that. They're meant to be reserves. Reserves are used for emergency purposes, capital improvement projects, and entrance fund refunds. Right. And I want to just, again, talk about the relevancy and the significance of the question. I mean, it's a question that the board rec reckons with and, and wrestles with. You know, when you have this much money in reserves, how much is enough money in reserves? And the reality is that the reserves have nothing to do with the revenue or the operating costs of the facility, except to improve the quality long-term and the sustainability long-term of the facility. The reserves were built upon the investments of the people who lived here before you and the investment strategy of the people who were on the board before me to get us to where we are and to protect the interests of the people who haven't moved in yet. And so there have been times, I will tell you, when the board goes, you know, can't we just use a reserve fund for that? And we talk about it and we'll go, no, here's what we can use for that. So I want to acknowledge the relevance and significance of the question because when you look at fee increases, when you have such large reserves, it is natural to ask that question. Understanding the answer to that question um, is also useful. Um, so, now you can go into the okay. other the, question. The other thing I would add to that is that, you know, the, with the reserves that we have spent on these various projects over the last several years, and I'm gonna get into some of those projects, um, we, we are actually saving money on an annual basis through savings by completing some of these projects. For instance, the heat strip and thermostat project was a capital reserve fund expenditure, but it ended up saving us thousands and thousands of dollars on our utility bill, which in turn have kept, kept the monthly service fees down. Um, one of the questions that we received, what percent of our budget and how much money is being used in 2022 for reducing our carbon footprint, recycling, composting, solar panels, etc. This year, about 6% of the annual expense budget, or $1.5 million, including the solar project, recycling efforts, LED lighting project, and boiler upgrades. This is an unusual year. Typically, it's 2 to 3%. <coughs> What has been the trend over the last five years been on a green agenda items that has, or what has been done, what are the projected impacts? We have continued to complete projects. We are become, becoming more green all the time, not for just the planet um, and our community, but for savings as well. This is an example of what I'm talking about. So this solar project that's being paid for is coming out of our reserves, right? It's a separate project. 
and the completion of the solar project is going to save us fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year in utility costs, and it decreases our carbon footprint. Um, last year, an LED lighting project was completed on the Windsor building and the Preston building the year before. Together, those two projects, about $28,000 a year in electricity costs were saved. Um, the boiler projects that we have completed and those that are going to be completed this year um, are improving boilers by being able to ramp up and only use the utilities that your um, demand calls for. That's saving us another thirty to thirty-six thousand dollars in a combination of electric and gas. Um, the cooling tower and chiller that we just replaced last year um, saves us around eighteen to twenty thousand dollars a year. The water well that we put in in twenty sixteen saves us ten to twelve thousand dollars a year in watering costs. The thermostat fan cool unit upgrades that we did thirty to thirty-six thousand dollars. The solar film and roof insulation projects. So replacing the roof on the Preston, we were able to put in a better insulation. Um, it's gonna save us 10 to $15,000 a year. So all of these projects that we're doing uh, yearly um, with those reserve funds are, are keeping costs down and allowing us to pass along lower in monthly service fee increases. Anybody <laughs> asleep out there? Y'all okay? <laughs> Um, how are the buy-in charges determined? They have been preset based on the size of apartment homes, square footage basically. A market analysis is completed periodically every three to five years for us to compare to. We also benchmark ourselves against other communities across the country and the area. Um, and then we traditional standard contract is 50% of the ROC contract. How are the buy-in amounts used and managed? They're used for entrance fee refunds, as I said, paying the mortgage, the bond payments, in other words, capital improvement projects, and they are managed for the, with the rest of our funds and are also board designated. Who decides financial investment policies at Westminster? The Westminster Board and Board Finance Committee in consultation with our investment manager, Luther King Capital, uh, me, and LCS. What financial decisions are made in what time frame? And this varies at times based on community needs, but the budget timeline, we always stick to that July to October. The investment policy is reviewed at least twice a year, more often as needed. We've looked at it quite a few times the last few months, as you can imagine. What role does LCS play in regard to our budget? LCS supports Westminster with reviews by LCS Financial Services providing an adaptive budget model specific to our community. The Director of Operations Management, my boss, reviews it and, it and provides input as well. And then monthly monitoring via report, reporting an LCS dashboard covering finance metrics and goals and any questions, support, or needs we may have throughout the month. Uh, what are the most significant financial factors that facilities like ours should be compared on? So here's a good one. Net operating margin, we are the pretty blue. Everybody else, the CLA Clifton Larson Allen Peer Group is much below us, as you can see. Um, fine, here's another one, debt service coverage ratio. We're again the pretty blue. We're doing quite well. Um, days cash on hand, we're the pretty blue. You have Clifton Larson Allen's peer group, that's the dark blue, and then the CCAC uh, median is that kind of taupe color, I guess. So we're doing very good there, too. Um, average age of the community. Mm. It's a good thing we're building an expansion. So that <laughs> we actually found a flaw in some of our um, retiring of some of our um, capital expenses. So, like, um, Healthcare center furniture, for instance, has a useful life of 10 years. It should have been depreciated off the balance sheet at 10 years, and it wasn't. So we made some adjustments. You can see in that top graph, top right-hand side. Um, so we're back below the benchmarks there, so that's good. Trending down, of course, as the expansions completed, will continue to trend down. How can you tell if a CCRC is financially viable? Well. Occupancy percentage is a good thing. You want to be about 90% 90, 90 or more. Uh, what are their bond ratings? Are they rated at all? 
Are they meeting their financial covenants? Is there positive cash flow to operations? Um, so meaning a balanced budget, right? How do we compare to other senior living facilities? We are among the best operating senior living facilities in the state of Texas and in the country, as affirmed by our triple B Fitch rating. How many senior living facilities have declared bankruptcy in 2022? Six in the state of Texas, 11 in the country. This does not include those that have defaulted on their bond payments and are trying to work through agreements with their bondholders. And that's about 200 plus. I'm glad to not be there. I need the reason to have a balanced budget. What was the primary reason for these bankruptcies? Declining occupancy, failure to reinvest in capital improvements, and they were highly leveraged communities. Debt service larger than the entrance fee and the operating income combined. Yeah. If Westminster has 1,500 months, I wish we had 1,500 months, of reserves, how does this compare to any regulatory or legal requirement? Yeah, it should be days, right? It's a date. So that means really if, if Westminster, if you ref refuse to pay your bill and we had to kick you out, we would do that. But um, if we stopped receiving revenue tomorrow, we would be okay for 1,400 days. Okay? So that's a good number. The, the bond covenant that we are required to have 180 days. Actually, when I started here in 2008, we had 186 days, just barely north of the bond code. A CCAC benchmark is 348. The Fitch Triple B benchmark is 527. Then we get into another question: What is living wage? Before you leave that, yep. Sorry, just, again, I wanted to just talk about this. Is really another important financial slide. Is in looking at the the benchmarks that we hit, and the fact that we're triple B uh, bond rated, there's seven of us in the country? There's about 50 of us rated, and we're only seven or better than we are. Okay, seven or better than us. So our financial stability is very, very, very sound. Um, and I think when you think through 1,500 days, if the worst case scenario happened, we could operate they only require you to do that for six months in the, in the covenant. And for 180 days covers you for six months. Um, which means they believe that if you had six months of operating capital, that you could get back on your feet within six months or figure out a way to transition. Well, this board of directors doesn't buy that for this community. We want more security and certainty about our future. And so I think it's a, a huge, um, uh, positive factor that we have um, that much cash on hand. It gives us a lot of flexibility, but it gives us a lot of security. Okay, now you can talk about wages. I will add that when we build up, when we bring on the expansion and it's actually going live, those days will automatically decrease because it will cost more to operate Westminster than it does today. So keep that in mind. What is the living wage in Austin, Texas? Um, this is what I got off the internet, $16.41 for an adult with no children. Two adults, one working, two children, $35.75. Um, this is actually a chart that was on the city website, and it's um, $18 with no children. Poverty wage is $6.19, minimum wage is seven and a quarter. One child is $34.90. I think that the question here was they sent they, they said in their question, living wage in Austin's $24, but I think that that person was saying that the city of Austin recently um, told the city manager to increase the city's minimum wage to $22 an hour. Um, and so that, that the living wage is a little different than that. I wanted to show some typical salaries in Austin compared to Westminster's average salary, salary to kind of answer that question a little more in depth. And you can see that almost every area, we are paying more an average salary. So that's all the, uh, the salaries in that um, category, average, right? Business and financial operations, typical salaries around 77, 
$1,436, we're paying $82,000. Um, an interesting one, food, food prep and serving related. Uh, about $23,000 is typical, we're paying almost double that, $39,000. Um, health, healthcare support, so like CNAs, private sitters, things like that. Um, certified nurses assistants, sorry, I sometimes talk in abbreviations. Um, $25,000, $26,000, we're paying $40,000 plus. Um, let's see, transportation and material moving. <coughs> Uh, Thirty-six and thirty-seven thousand dollars on average. We're paying almost forty-two thousand. Um, so really, in most cases, Westminster is paying above what's typical in Austin, and we'll continue to ramp up and do that. Uh, which is probably why it's going to be really difficult to maintain a three percent increase uh, because of all the market pressure and the salary pressure that we're getting. Do we have appropriate step ups for tenured personnel? Yes, we do. Every single position at Westminster, we have a three-tier system. So an associate, every associate can promote themselves by achieving skills and cross-training during their time here. Even the dishwasher. We have a dishwasher level one, two, and three. So you can better yourself. And it, you know, it's just a way for self-promotion. A server, a hospitality um, ambassador, we're calling them, because nobody wants to be a server anymore, but um, those folks can promote themselves. They can be server level one, two, and three, which, eat, which um, at each increase, each tier, you get more pay. Um, CNA is the same way, housekeepers are the same way, janitors, receptionists, everybody. Um, servers with years of tenure are making the same as new hires now that starting wages have gone up. Is that true? No, that is not true. When increases to base wages were given, all associates received uh, an increase in that job classification. Um, now, if a person comes in off the street and they have 10 years of experience, they may make more because of their experience, but not because they're making more than a tenured employee. So if an employee has been here two years and somebody comes in with 10 years of experience, it's possible there, but not not because, not on the same level. How is the budget set and by whom? The budget is created and proposed by the department directors, the executive director, working with life care services, and then approved by the board of directors. Is that enough directors? Can residents have a copy of the budget? Can residents provide input regarding the budget via WRA committees? You can on your own budget for the WRA, but no, you can't have a detailed budget, Westminster's budget. No, a detailed copy of the budget should not be provided to the residents. Residents have voting representation on the board of directors, which is highly unusual in the industry. Residents also provide input to the board and leadership with regard to the budget through various WRA committees and the board committees. All committee priorities are considered while creating the budget and prioritizing the spending for the community. Question, return of capital, why is it limited to 90% and how many apartments does it affect? 90% has been an industry standard for many decades and ensures some attrition income for all contracts, which helps Westminster cover its obligations. The number of ROC contracts is about 50% community-wide. Am I running out of time? No. No, uh, you like this, huh? Okay, three million plus interest. <laughs> Expenses shows up. I told you I'm very transparent. I'm not hiding anything. So almost all of this is true. No, I'm telling you. <laughs> Just seeing if you're paying attention. <laughs> Three million plus interest expense shows up on a recent annual statement. What debt is occurring interest currently? All construction debt and bond debt is occurring interest. About 3.38% interest. Isn't that an awesome interest rate? Yeah, it is. Sure is. How do I get a copy of the annual report? Just ask any reception desk, marketing, or stop by my office. Why is the annual report not posted on the resident portal? It is. I am sorry that it wasn't. It is now. And it's our fault, right, Ruth? Because we didn't send it to you. We didn't send it to Ruth. So, What is the most financially secure facility like ours in the U.S.? Moorings Park, Westminster, Canterbury, Richmond, Royal Oaks Life Care Community, and Forest at Duke are some good examples though none of them have my residence, so they can't be nearly as good. <laughs> or my staff, for that matter. There are about 5,000 senior living communities in the U.S., less than 10% investment rated. 
Uh, Clifton, Larson, Allen, our investment auditors, our, our auditors, financial auditors, um, they serve 344 communities. Only 15 communities that they serve are even rated investment grade. And only seven are rated better than Westminster. So you really live at a great place. Um, speaking of being a great place. No, we, hold on, hold on. Okay. Yep. Again, this is one of those things, just real quickly, because we're coming to the end of it. And I want you just to, after hearing all of that information, and then we'll get to questions right after this, there are additional questions. Ruth, can you walk around and collect it cards? Is, and just is, put them in the air. It is important for you to see during this last year and year and a half, really, during the pandemic, what has been achieved by the associates in this facility. So we have a tendency to just, these always come up at the end of Chuck's presentation when he gives it to the board. And it's always just, oh, we got this award and this award and this award and this award. And this award. Oh, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good. But at some point, especially at these meetings, I just want to take one second and say, please just pay a little of attention to these next two slides. Thank you. And I'll talk slower. Okay, anybody that has a question that you've written on your cards, please hold your cards up in the air so Maria and Ruth can pick those up. And then I will look through them and decide if I want to answer them. <laughs> all right, so thank you all for, okay, best nursing home on a roll. Um, five star rated for the 14th year. Gold award for a year like no other. That's our annual report that we just produced. Um, JD Power Award for Senior Living, third year in a row. Experience rating, so nobody cares about this but me. But our experience rating, meaning the workers' comp injuries that we have, um, our experience and our historical experience on that has decreased, meaning we've had less injuries than what's typical in the industry for a senior living community. And that means our work comp insurance decreases, which helps keep what low? Monthly service fees. You were supposed to be quicker than that, okay. Ellen Spear won the 80 over 80 award. Ruth Sunil won the Service Elect Excellence Award through Leading Age Texas. Our Assisted Living won the AIR Award for 10 years of deficiency-free assisted living surveys. We won the Gold Award for our annual report, A Year Like No Other, from Hermes. Phase one, Windsor expansion. It almost killed me, but we got it done April 11th at open. 55th anniversary, 55 years of being an awesome place to live. Um, April 20, 2022, um, deficiency-free financial audit, like Paul said, for the last nine years. Um, deficiency-free healthcare center survey, um, which is unheard of in this day and age. U.S. News and World Report, best senior living, independent living, and assisted living. Thanks to all of you for filling out that stupid survey. <laughs> that got recorded, didn't it? Oh, well. Triple <laughs> and our triple B stable bitch rating with a construction part project not even finished yet. Um, and that's pretty incredible, too. Uh, before I end my time and I answer questions, minimum of, okay, so food truck festival. This is our kickoff to our Alzheimer's Texas fundraising on Friday, July the 22nd from 12 to 3 in the Preston Courtyard. Please bring a minimum donation of at least $5 for a great burger and a great snow cone. And then we're gonna have our Westminster Dog Show fundraiser to benefit Alzheimer's Texas on August the 31st, starting at two o'clock in Harrisville Hall. And that's all the stuff I have to talk about, except for questions. Anything? I've covered the um, question. I'm going to pass, to pass it up. What is the average monthly utility bill? The electricity is around $60,000 a month. The gas bills around six, the water bills around six as well. Uh, got that. The Preston elevators in the lobby are very noisy and scary a lot of the time. I'll have a look at that. That's a statement. That's a statement. That's a, 
And we will have them look at it. We just had those um, refurbished. Sometimes they're low on oil and we need to check that. I'll, I'll, check, I'll have them check on that. Given what recently happened with the power failure and Wi-Fi not functioning, have you considered using a service like Remind? Remind.com allows one to send a text message to all those enrolled. One can send a Remind text. Yes, yeah, we actually, there's another service that LCS is contracted with and we're considering that, yes. We have made investments in of saving electricity services. To what extent are we protected if the Texas grid fails this summer? Well, we're on the emergency circuit, so it's not supposed to, we're not supposed to be involved in rolling blackouts. Um, we have generators. The Carlisle building will completely be 100% generator powered. Um, the Windsor building has areas of refuge within it, and so does the Preston building. Um, but, we're again, we're not supposed to be affected by rolling blackouts. And I would just add that when I, I live close enough to here that we benefited during the pandemic of not being, of not losing our electricity because y'all are in that, we're in the same circuit as you. Um, so that was a real blessing. Um, I also will tell you that the, this is an area that the board is asking Chuck to look into with regard to how much would it cost to get the generation capacity if for both summer and winter to, to cover uh, all the buildings. Um, and that's where the advanced planning with the Carlisle came in. So we'll be looking um, as a board to see what the different options and alternatives are for that. Yeah, we're drawing up the plans right now actually to replace both the Windsor and Preston generators with generators that will provide power for all the bells and whistles and functions in both buildings. We have an idea of what that might cost. I won't tell you about that today. <laughs> we want to leave on a good note. Yeah, I didn't, so speaking of that, I got two more things I'd like to do. One, any resident member who has ever served on the board, I would like you to at least raise your hand as a resident association. I know Tibby's there. Tibby may be the only one who's, who else is there. Shelly, you're still there. You're still serving. You can't say that. <laughs> so, so um, again, Tibby, thank you for your service and all the residents that Max Sherman is not here today, but um, uh, Terrell Blodgett, we've had some phenomenal members, Pete Florham, just great people. And, he, and I also want to thank uh, Camille for her leadership in helping putting this together. Um, <laughs> now, in, in this day and age, it's always better just to get out in front, ask the questions, answer the questions the best you can, and give the facts and, uh, and, and be honest because you know, we want, we want as a board to make sure that we have your confidence, that we're doing everything we possibly can to make your life better. Um, and we do that primarily by doing what he tells us is needed because he stays so closely attuned to what you need. And um, I think we are extremely blessed to have Chuck Worst as our executive director. Thank you all for coming. Wasn't that a very well articulated and organized out of 45 questions with subsets among them? That held your attention the entire 30, 40 minutes. That was a 40 minute presentation. Thank you, Chuck, for your ability to choose and your staff's ability to choose. But let me say, that did not get all the questions answered that were submitted. And I promise you, we will follow up on every one of those that were not addressed. And Chuck has some plans to have some smaller type sessions. Um, some of those questions were a very, well, these were complicated enough. But there are subsets of things that are even more complicated that it's nicer to have a small group where we can have a more interactive kind of a conversation. But every one of those, this was recorded. You will be able to go back and hear it. You'll be able to tell the people you know that wanted to be here, the residents, to come and listen to it, see it. And then any subsequent ones that Chuck does small, 
those will be recorded. So, uh, and keep sending questions. I mean, keep sending me questions. You can always send questions to Chuck. You can always meet with Chuck as well. Um, but thank you very, very much for coming today. And, um, and I would make one request of you all. Take a day or so and think about this. And if there's something that was really important to you about something that you learned today, if you would send me an email about that. I would like to collect the things that were surprises, the things that you're proud of. If there's something you're not proud of, your reaction to this presentation, just a short, I, you know, I'm, I'm fine if you want to do a long one, but I'm asking you just to do something short that's off the top of your head. And let's keep these conversations going. Um, we really do have a fabulous set of associates and staff that serve us. And that starts at the top. And we keep them by how we interact and relate with them. And Paul and Diane, thank you all for being here today and for your added emphasis on certain areas. My frustration has been since the beginning that I started this year, when we have a presentation by Chuck, we have pages and pages of awards, right? But there's so many of them, we don't really know what many of them even mean or whatever. So that's something I want to work on is if we could categorize them or simplify them in some way, or maybe just spend a little more time every once in a while on the ones and that relate to certain things and, and categories so that each of us have interest in certain areas can talk about those kinds of awards in context of what they really mean and help communicate and educate people. Thank you all again for coming, and let's thank these guys for one last time. Thank you. And then, um, please help yourself to refreshments and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you for being here.